Education Finance and Policy Committee will come to order for March 11th, 2021. Today we have um, four bills on the agenda and we'll start with Senate File 1984, Senator Duckworth. Are you there? I am here, Mr. Chair, thank you. I do have an author's amendment, uh, the A2 amendment. Senator Duckworth offers the A2 amendment. Wait, Senator Duckworth can't offer the A2 amendment. Senator, uh, Senator Rarick offers the A2 amendment. Senator Duckworth, go ahead and give us a little explanation of the A2 amendment. Uh, sure thing, Mr. Chair, happy to do so. Uh, it kind of uh, cleans up the bill a little bit and adds some definitions to uh, items in the bill that will be referenced during its description, Mr. Chair. So the, the A2 amendment puts the bill in the form that the author would like it to be. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. The motion is adopted. The A2 amendment is on the bill. Senator Duckworth, to your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the bill in front of you today makes several important changes which will improve the impact of the teacher candidate grant and teacher loan forgiveness programs. Uh, first, it corrects definition issues which have caused the program to perform poorly as an incentive for students to teach in severe shortage areas. The new definition provides clarity about who is eligible for the program so that it can function properly as an incentive to students. Under current language, the eligible license areas change every year and shift depending on where in the state you happen to teach. The purpose of these programs is to incentivize students to choose to teach in licensure areas where the state has severe shortages without clearly delineating which licensure areas will result in an award from these programs. Students don't know if, they're, if they will benefit from these programs when they choose which licensure to pursue in college. If we want these programs to truly incentivize students to choose certain areas in which to teach, we have to make it very clear uh, which areas those are. Second, the eligibility change, uh, changes made in this bill refocuses the program on the most severe shortage areas uh, across the state so that limited funds are directed toward the highest and needed areas. This really just prioritizes our funding for where it's truly most severely needed. Under the current definition of shortage area, every teacher across the state qualifies with the exception of teachers in the fourth economic development region where only some teachers qualify. In 2018, 274 awards went to elementary education teachers with the next highest award area coming in at only 78 awards. Uh, this is not what it was intended to do um, in terms of directing funding towards shortage areas. We would have to increase this appropriation tenfold just to cover current applicants. If we want this program to truly function as a tool for closing shortage areas, we need to refocus the criteria and target those teaching areas with most in need. Uh, and lastly, one of the largest shortages we have in the state is in special education, uh, something that is in critical need of our attention and resources given the situation we find ourselves in. Kids needing special education services are among our most vulnerable students. They need teachers with specialized training to ensure they have the same chance at success as other students. Another high priority is the shortage of teachers of color. We know that having a teacher of color can lift the achievement of students in color. Ensuring our students have access to these teachers is a moral imperative. Uh, properly leveraging the state funds in these programs to real dent in the most needed shortage areas is an absolute no-brainer. With that, I'd like to turn it over to my testifiers, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your time. Thank you, um, Senator Duckworth. Any questions of, from the committee members of Senator Duckworth before we go to testifiers? Okay, seeing none, then um, Matt Shaver. Uh, Matt, uh, identify yourself for the record and then uh, please go forward with your testimony. Great. Um, Chair Tomasoni, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Matt Shaver, Policy Director at Ed Allies, a statewide education advocacy nonprofit. Prior to starting this role in January, I had been a teacher for nine years and did my undergrad work at Concordia College in Moorhead in elementary education. So as you can probably imagine, I have some personal experience with student debt and licensure shortage areas. So I'm here to testify in strong support of Senate File 1984. I want to thank Senator Duckworth and Chair Tomasani for their leadership on this bill. Senate File 1984 consolidates and concentrates resources to support teachers where they are needed most acutely. Grants for teacher candidates and loan forgiveness for teachers are two programs that make sense in the policy space, but in practice have not gotten resources and support to the teachers and licenses they were intended for. 
The current definition of shortage area inadvertently qualifies pretty much every teacher, which makes the pool really wide for these incentives and dilutes their impact. Our teacher force is overwhelmingly white, and there are a number of great initiatives working to diversify the educators our kids learn from. And while we pursue those avenues, we also need to continue to refine existing programs. By better and more equitably targeting these resources, we can align their purpose and statute with their impact and practice. According to the Teacher Shortage Loan Forgiveness Program Annual Report from 2021, in 2018 and 2019, there were a total of 3,927 applications for the funds. 3,527 of those applications came from white teachers. In the last two years, there have been a total of 1,687 awards received, and they have overwhelmingly gone to teachers with elementary ed licenses. The current system privileges white teachers and crowds out the people and licenses our schools and kids need most right now. It isn't working. These changes would mean that my elementary license would not qualify me for loan repayments anymore, and that's okay. While I was teaching, I applied for that program every year, never got selected anyway, because the pool was too broad with the current definition of shortage areas. So that might mean that white teachers don't necessarily get to be at the front of the line for a program or benefit, and that's okay. We'll be okay. The identified licensure areas, special ed, English as a second language, physics, chemistry, math, and middle level science have all been shortages for more than a decade. It makes sense to hold up those licenses specifically as a route for new teachers to pursue. Passing this bill means prospective teachers with student debt can count on opportunities for debt reduction if they pursue those fields specifically, regardless of where they teach or what year they apply. That's a good thing and something Ed Allies is proud to support. Thank you again to Senator Duckworth and Senator and Chair Tomasani. Thank you all for your time and thank you all for your public service. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shaver. Um, let's move on to Sam Walsa. Sam, you know, you know the drill. I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Sam Walseth speaking on behalf of the 230 school districts across greater Minnesota as part of the Minnesota Rural Education Association. I'm speaking today in support of Senate File 1984 as amended, and thank you to Senator Duckworth for bringing this bill forward. Uh, while teacher shortages are widespread, they've been particularly acute in rural communities for many years and spanning almost every category of licensure. We hear stories from rural districts about their struggles with even finding elementary staff. Uh, MREA advocated for the creation of this program a number of years ago, uh, and the legislature did respond at that time. Uh, we do appreciate Senate File 1984 as it's going to help provide some clarity to teacher candidates as they consider teaching as a profession. We believe incentives such as this program are needed to help uh, attract and retain new teachers in schools. We know dollars are tight. We hope in the future you'll also consider uh, providing state dollars to meet the demand for this program that will exist in the wake of these changes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll just leave it there. Uh, thank you for the work on the bill and I appreciate your support. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul Spies. Good afternoon, Chair. Thomasonian members, my name is Paul Spies with the Coalition to Increase Teachers of Color, American Indian Teachers in Minnesota. And I was here on February 16th for Senator Abler's Senate File 797 bill hearing as part of the Increased Teachers of Color Act, which four of you have co-authored on this committee. And rather than state that the coalition is for or against Senate File 1984, it's better to state that the coalition supports some of the intent, but is concerned and has some cautions about some of the language. There are insights that don't seem to be fully considered yet in the language related to the shortage area and rural intent. For example, we're in favor of supporting student teachers in rural areas, but we don't think that the intent will be accomplished as worded in, 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 in this bill. Before I talk more specifically about the bill, I'd like to address the implicit assumption I see in the bill, namely that rural teachers are not teachers of color or American Indian teachers. Uh, while it's true that most diverse teachers are in the Twin Cities, the shortage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers exists in every economic development region in, and school district throughout greater Minnesota, not just in the Twin Cities metro area. And as you know, there's a tremendous and increasing E-12 student diversity throughout the whole state. So we appreciate Senator Duckworth, uh, his leadership and co-authoring the E-12 Increased Teacher of Color Act and we support the definition of rural school district being added to this, this uh, statute. We also support half of the uh, amendment language, which states that uh, if there are insufficient funds,
to provide an award to all eligible applicants. The commissioner shall prioritize awards based on, and number two in, in that amendment says, whether the applicant teaches in a rural school district. It should be full stop there and not, um, not beyond that because uh, just, a, just attending a district, or sorry, attending an institution in greater Minnesota doesn't guarantee in any way that uh, the student teacher would wanna teach in greater Minnesota. I, for one, grew up in Bloomington. I went to Moorhead State, but I wanted to teach in Minneapolis or St. Paul. So we prefer and suggest that you look at our language in Senate file 797 uh, that addresses permanent residence as another factor to consider along with student teaching in a rural district. Mr. Speed, before you go any further, um, mm -hmm. go, you, you said you were concerned about the language in the A2 amendment. Um, do you have it in front of you? I do. Uh, where, what, which line in, in, are you concerned about? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Lines 1.6 and 1.7. Okay. And, and 1.8. And you think it should say what? So if the, if the, if it's, if it ended after rural district and you didn't include, or the student teacher student is attending a post -sec secondary institution outside the seven county metro area, Okay. Just attending a, a college or university in greater Minnesota doesn't mean anything. There's a lot of people from the Twin Cities who attend colleges and universities in greater Minnesota, but never stay there. Okay. I just wanted to be clear as to what you were uh, speaking to. Okay. If you have more testimony, go ahead. Thank you, sir. So... Besides, besides that piece, uh, we also think that it would be important uh, to, to, as the testifiers have said, focus on the most severe licensure shortage areas in the state. And while it's true that special education, ESL, physics, chemistry, math, and middle level science are shortage areas, and that it would be clear for candidates, these are not, in each economic development region, the most severe. In Senate file 797, we have language that would identify the 10 most severe licensure shortage areas by economic development regions. So it's more complicated than this language, but uh, there are several licensure shortage areas that are not included and uh, are not the most severe in each economic development region. Finally, I'd just like to say thank you for your consideration of this feedback. And uh, as you have a priority in the bill for uh, those candidates who are seeking to teach in rural areas and licensure shortage areas, we think that it would be uh, fair to have priority for those teachers who are in rural districts and also persons of color. Uh, so kind of an either or, it, either it's the licensure shortage area or they're a person of color and they, they student teach in a, in a rural district. Thank you for your consideration of this feedback. We we'll look forward to working with you on your omnibus bill to make sure that the needs of rural stakeholders also address the shortage of teachers of color in the most severe licensure shortage areas. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spies. Um, um, Senator Duckworth, uh, I don't know if you have any comments on, on Mr. Spee's um, comments, but if you're not ready to comment just next, we can go on to your last testifier and then we'll come back to you. So I'll save it for the end, Mr. Chair. Thank okay. you for the opportunity. Okay, Megan uh, Fitzgibbon, uh, are you there somewhere? Yes, I'm here, Senator Thompsoni. This okay. is Megan Fitzgibbon with the Office of Higher Education. Okay. Um, and I'm just, actually the amendment um, uh, did uh, cover a lot of the, um, the questions and um, comments that we had on the original bill from the Office of Higher Education. Um, and so I, I don't really have too much else to add other than um, I think we can, um, the only thing we'd have to do is to try to clarify um, the definition of rural district. We're not exactly sure how that, um, 
how that can be done at this point. So we just have to try to work with MDE to try to, to gather the, the correct data um, to see if we can do that. Okay. Um, it's my understanding the data is pretty easy to find too. So, um, Senator Duckworth, back to you now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I appreciate that. And thank you to those that testified. Um, Regarding um, the talking point, uh, any assumptions that were made regarding this bill, I'll just be very clear. The, the assumption uh, that's being made is that there's a shortage of, of teachers of color and shortage of teachers for critical areas across the state, period, uh, in some places more than others, and we're simply trying to address that, that issue, and I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, I did have a conversation where we did solicit some feedback or get some feedback from Mr. Spees and others ahead of time, hence the amendment certainly open to feedback and working with folks to make this as best as, as we possibly can. The good news is it sounds like that we have multiple bills attempting to bring forward solutions to this issue. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'm very hopeful uh, and confident that uh, you know an all-encompassing bill can maybe be put together that brings the best of all of these into something that can really uh, do some good in terms of this issue we're facing across the state. That's all I've got, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Uh, are there any questions or comments from any of the committee members on uh, Senate file 1984. Okay, seeing none then, um, we'll, we will uh, continue to work on this as, as we go through the uh, legislative session and as we uh, put together the omnibus bill. And so if some language needs to be worked out, I'm sure we can do that. And um, with that, we will lay Senate file 1984 as amended, we'll lay it over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So thank you, Senator Duckworth, and thank you to thank the you, testifiers. I'm really liking this hybrid stuff. This is way better. <laughs> Members, um, let's move to the uh, next bill, Senate file 1977. Senator Eichhorn, you are the first senator to testify live in front of the Senate Higher Ed Committee. So I think you get some points for that. So well, it's an honor to be here, Mr. <laughs> Chair. And this will be my first time presenting in person this year. So I appreciate the opportunity. Senator Eichhorn, go ahead. All right. Thank you again for the opportunity to present Senate File 1977. These are for emergency assistant grants. In each year, uh, in each budget year since I've been in the Senate, I've carried a bill to increase funding for emergency assistant grant programs. Got the computer in front of me too, so there we go. I'm still on there. All right. So this program provides small grants to low-income students facing emergencies that could cause them to drop out of college. In 2019, the higher ed bill did include some one-time funding increases for the program, and less than a year later, as we all know, the pandemic hit, causing a steep increase in the number of small emergencies our student populations experienced. Demand for this program shot up, and even colleges who didn't already have a program such as this scrambled to set one up for students in need. I've always been deeply committed to the impact of this program, but I had no idea that it would one day be one of the most critical programs we could have in place to help students weather a pandemic. As we get, begin to recover from the devastating effects of the pandemic, additional funding for this program is needed now more than ever. Too many students are struggling to make ends meet while completing their degree, and a helping hand at the right time could mean the difference between someone going on to graduate college and earn a living wage and somebody dropping out of school because they're struggling to make ends meet. Mr. Chair, I know as we, we just got our uh, budget targets, and I mean, there's, I, I know there will be a lot to, to go into your targets. We left the appropriation in this bill blank, uh, obviously, um, knowing that you'll have some work to do in that realm. But our plea simply is, is that you consider dedicating as much funding as practically possible to this program. Uh, the need is great, as is the potential for the students who can be helped by this program. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn it over to our testifiers who could offer some firsthand uh, experience of what this program has meant to them. Okay, thank you, um, Senator Eichhorn. Are there any questions or comments from members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll turn it over to your testifiers. Uh, Becky Nordin, uh, Dean of Students, uh, are you here? There you are, okay. Yes, I am. Hello, okay. Welcome Chair to Persons the committee. Sony. Hello, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Becky Nordine, and I hold a master's degree in higher education administration from St. Louis University. I am the Dean of Students at Minneapolis College, and I've been employed at the college for 16 years, 
and in higher education for over 22. As you may know, our campus is a member of the Minnesota State System of Colleges and Universities. My testimony will describe the impact of emergency grants on our students and how these grants are critical to helping at-risk students continue on their academic pathways. Our students here attend the only comprehensive community and technical college within the city of Minneapolis. Our urban setting allows students who are unlikely to succeed elsewhere to have an opportunity to attain their credential, elevate their socioeconomic status, and contribute to the economy of the region. A third of our students are first generation. 72% are from historically excluded groups. Nearly half rely on Pell Grants for tuition assistance, and nearly 70% rely on some sort of financial aid. As you can imagine, these students typically face multiple barriers to their academic success, even in a pre-pandemic environment. COVID-19 put many of our students out of work. They were unable to support their families and unable to access transportation and social services they rely upon. It also elevated mental health concerns for them, as well as the family members that they care for. And even for the hardest working students with the most grit, it completely disrupted their educational journeys. For example, we worked with a student in our nursing program who had their car broken into. Their laptop, cell phone, and purse were all stolen. As a single parent of three, this student couldn't afford to replace the laptop and in today's online learning environment due to the pandemic, the student would not have been able to complete their coursework without receiving an emergency grant. Another student in our polysonography program was required to attend a clinical site in St. Cloud. This student's car broke down and needed repair to be able to get him to and from the clinical site. Without an emergency grant to help cover these costs, the student would have dropped out of college. We also provided emergency assistance to a student who is an essential worker. Because of the student's job working with the public, their family refused to allow them to come home due to their fear of the pandemic. An emergency grant provided the student a place to sleep until they could return home. Like these students, many others have been challenged navigating services and courses through an online platform using their smartphone and having poor or no internet access readily available. It requires additional effort and abilities to connect with instructors, classmates, tutors, and the library, and all support services our campus provides to help them succeed. As you can see, these emergency grants allow us to help our students persist in spite of a wide range of challenges. Unfortunately, too many of our students are trying to earn their credential and at the same time are uncertain where their next meal is coming from or where they're going to sleep tonight. According to January 2020 Hope Center Re -college, our Real College Survey, 45% of our Minneapolis College student respondents experienced food insecurity in the prior 30 days. 60% of the Minneapolis College student respondents experienced housing insecurity in the previous year. 27% of our college student respondents experienced homelessness in the previous year. Food insecurity, housing insecurity, and homelessness are overlapping concerns, with 69% of students at Minneapolis College experiencing at least one of these forms of basic needs and security within the past year. Emergency assistance helps us ensure equitable success for all of our students, regardless of their race, ethnicity, economic status, or whether they were first in their family to attend a college. Helping students like ours achieve their educational goals is essential as our community, state, and nation recovers economically from COVID-19 and other recent disruptions. Now, more than ever, a high level of commitment to education by lawmakers is needed as the decisions being made will directly influence college students' ability to achieve their academic goals and in turn support the viability of their communities and fulfill the need of tomorrow's workforce. Thank you again for this opportunity to share information about our students and I'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you, um, Dean uh, Becky. 
Uh, let's move. Let's move on to uh, the next testifier, Madison Saki, from a uh, student at Riverland Community College. Madison, are you there? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Chair Thomasoni and, and members of the Senate Higher Education Committee. For the record, my name is Madison South. I'm a student at Riverland Community College and serve as the Public Relations Coordinator at LEAD MN. Thank you for having me here and considering my story and my experience with student emergency grants. I would like to thank Senator Eichhorn for introducing Senate File 1977. This program is critical to the success of Minnesota's community and technical college students who are facing barriers to their education from financial crises, emergency situations, and basic needs that have come with the onset of the pandemic. Exactly this time last year, I was enrolled in 10 credits. I was the student Senate president on Riverland's campus. I worked a work study job. I was a part-time teller at my local credit union and renting an apartment with just me and my dog on the lease. When significant changes happened in our lives due to COVID-19, I thought that I was one of the lucky ones that wouldn't be greatly impacted because I was deemed an essential worker. At the end of March, I quickly realized that I was wrong. My hours were significantly cut at work and I no longer found sufficient work study hours at the college to make up for the lost time. I felt a mix of sadness and frustration for being called an essential worker, but not essential enough to have all of the staff at our credit union work their normal hours. And quite honestly, I felt like I was also missing assistance from my family, but I can't blame them because I come from a lower income background where my expected family contribution for college is zero. Because my reduction in hours and income, I needed additional funding to help me pay my rent or I would risk falling behind and potentially losing my apartment. I applied for the emergency grant on Riverland's campus and within a few days, I was approved to receive $300 in the form of rent assistance. This grant was temporary assistance that took a lot of weight off my shoulders for just a little while and allowed me extra time to find another part-time job working at Domino's, making pizza for some extra money on the weekends. Receiving this grant also allowed me to remain focused on my studies and to keep doing the work of a student Senate president, trying to keep our students stay afloat during the early days of the pandemic. Emergency grants like these are designed to provide temporary relief, but inarguably cause a positive ripple effect that greatly helps students' lives and improves their chances of graduation. The Minnesota Office of Higher Education report on the emergency assistance for post-secondary students grant shows the effectiveness of this program with students being retained at a higher rate at nearly every college awarded grant funding in 2018 to 2019. A few hundred dollars from an emergency grant in March can translate to completing the semester or keeping a roof over a student's head. And certainly I'm not the only one who was granted emergency funding from Riverland. For other students, their emergency grant was used to put food on the table, put diapers on their baby, or provide a daycare payment so that they could keep moving forward in their education. Your support for Senate File 1977 is a major step for not only supporting students like me, but the thousands of other students that have identified that they need additional assistance and ones, and, uh, ones that will continue to struggle after this pandemic has ended. Thank you for your time and for listening to my story. I hope that you will continue to listen to stories of real college students living through real situations like mine and supporting Senate File 1977. Thank you, Madison, very much. Any, any comments or questions from committee members? Okay, so I, I just have a couple of questions that I don't know if you, you can answer them or not. This is all new language, and so um, I'm just curious. On the first line, it says uh, the higher, Office of Higher Education shall make grants on a matching basis. Um, is it a one-for-one -one matching basis? Is it... Uh, who matches it? Does the institution match it? Um, how, how, are, how are we determining that? Does, I don't know if you know this or not, Senator Eichhorn is. Are you, are you asking me, Mr. Chair, or are you asking if, staff for if assistance? You know, uh, if you know the answer, fine. Otherwise, if I, maybe Ms. White or is, is somebody from higher ed? Uh, you, uh, staff can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong but I, my understanding in the past was that the individual universities that set this up would match it on a dollar for dollar basis. That was my understanding. It may be different than that, um, but that was my understanding previously. Okay, if, we've done if, this before. if that's not correct, will somebody chime in here? Okay, I'm not getting anybody offering anything. So uh, the second thing I'm wondering is, um, what is a demonstrable homeless student population? How, how, uh, how do we determine that? Does any, can anybody tell me that?
Mr. Chair. Okay. okay. Who's, who's, who's yelling, yelling here? here? Oh, Ms. Oh, White. White. Okay. Joan okay. White, okay. Um, okay. Senate Council. Um, the Office of Higher Education determines um, the demonstrable homeless student population based on data from each that each school submits to, in their application. What level this the homeless population has to be within that institution? I'm not sure. Um, maybe Ohi can answer that, but I know they get data from the school in the application as to how many homeless students they have. Um, Ms. Oliver, you can you add to that? Sorry, um, hi. Go, Mary. No, you go, Nikki. Okay, who's it? whoever, whoever. I, I, I'm, I'm confident you've done this before. It was just, just a matter of um, how did you do it. Is what I'm, is what I'm, I'm, I'm looking at here. Um, Mr. Chair, this is Meredith Fergus with the Minnesota Office of Higher Education. Okay. Um, that grant is administered through Ms. Oliver's division at the Office of Higher Education. So um, I'm trying to, but I- Sorry, I'm, I'm here. I, okay. I was having technical difficulties, okay. my apology. All right. Um, uh, for the record, my name is Nikki Oliver. I'm the manager of grants and government relations. And uh, yes, uh, what uh, Ms. White said is, is accurate. The, uh, the colleges submit um, information to our office. Sometimes it's because they, they've done a survey of the homeless population around their college area or um, other data that they provide to show that demonstrable need. Uh, and, and do we know how much was appropriated uh, previously? Because we have some blanks in our, in our bill here as far as the appropriation is concerned. So I believe the original appropriation was $175,000 a year, and then we got a one-time increase uh, in the last uh, budget year. Um, so I think we're at 269 a year, but that's gonna drop back down. And, the, and that was matched by the institutions, is that correct? Yes, the, yes, the institutions uh, have to provide a match. And did we use all the money? Yes, all the money was awarded. Um, in fiscal year 20, we got over $800,000 in requests from 20 institutions. Um, and with the limited funding, obviously, we couldn't award all the institutions. OK, thank you. Senator Claussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Fergus or someone from the Office of Higher Education, Nikki, uh, could you, I know it's in the uh, suggested budget coming up in the governor's budget and also in the Office of Higher Education. So uh, could you share with us uh, the amount that's in the uh, proposed budget? Ms. Oliver. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Claussen, you asked, can I list the amount that's in the governor's budget? Uh, correct. Claussen. In the, in the governor's budget uh, that we reviewed earlier this uh, session, is all I believe. Yep, I believe we're increasing um, the program amount to. Sorry, one second. I'll pull it up to meet the actual need based on the previous um, applications or grants that we uh, had received, and that exact amount. Sorry, I apologize for not having that up in front of me. Um, Mr. Chair, yes. members, I, I think White. the amount is $825,000 per year Okay, thank in the you, governor's Ms. budget. Thank you, Ms. White. Yeah, thank you. I apologize. Senator I have Clausen. too many documents up and not the right one, apparently. Senator Claussen. So that's uh, about for the biennium, $1.6 million, roughly? Ms. White. Mr. Chair and members, yes, that's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Seeing none, Senator Eichhorn, we will lay over Senate File 1977 for a possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much for coming to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the opportunity to present in person. I appreciate it. Okay. Um,
center class and you could be here, you know, presenting in person also, but <laughs> I see you're not. So anyway, um, so you're up next, Senator Klassen, with Senate File 829. Yeah, thank Senator you, Mr. Klassen. Chair. Senator Once Klassen. I have the immunizations, I will be joining you, and I uh, okay. scheduled my second immunization on the 20th, so I, I can't wait until that happens. So. I, can, I can understand how that is. Okay, go yeah. ahead, Senator Klassen, Senate File 829. Well, thank you, Chair Thomasoni and committee members. And, and thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 829. It's a bill appropriating funds to support the work of College Possible. College Possible Minnesota is a statewide nonprofit program that's dedicated to closing the degree divide and make college possible for students from low income backgrounds through coaching and ongoing support. The coaching and support are provided by recent college graduates who served through the AmeriCorps program as peer coaches. Mentoring begins in the junior year of high school and continues through the college years. The program currently supports over 2,300 college-bound students enrolled in 66 high schools throughout Minnesota and over 4,000 college students at 57 colleges and universities. College Possible is making a difference in supporting low-income youth to achieve their dream of earning a certificate two-year or a four-year degree. Education, as we know, changes lives. And with the help of College Possible, low-income young people are being given the opportunity to create a better life for themselves and contribute to the future of Minnesota. You have been provided the 2020 College Possible Minnesota Impact Report. Uh, I'd like members uh, just to turn your attention to that. It's got a lot of good information in it. And at this time, I'd like to testify to the testifiers to further share the college possible story. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Claussen. Uh, any questions of Senator Claussen before I move on to the testifiers? Seeing none, I, uh, Jeff Wilson, welcome to the committee. Just say your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Yes, thank you uh, for the record. Name is Jeff Wilson, Executive Director at College Possible Minnesota. I want to start by just th saying thanks so much, Mr. Chair and esteemed Senators. Uh, Mr. Chair, we deeply appreciate the opportunity to have this bill heard today. And thank you, Senator Clausen, for introducing the bill. Uh, College Possible programming begins in a student's junior year of high school. Our high school programming focuses on college knowledge, campus visits, ACT preparation, college application assistance, FAFSA completion, navigating scholarships and financing college, financial literacy, and the transition from high school into college. As Senator Clausen mentioned, one of the unique things about our program is that we continue to support students until they graduate from college. Our college programming focuses on navigating the, the college landscape and accessing critical resources, understanding the unwritten rules of college, building self-advocacy skills, career readiness, and continued support in FAFSA completion, financing college, and financial literacy. And our results are outstanding in the field. Last year, 99% of college possible students were accepted into college. And while a recent National Student Clearinghouse report showed that the number of 2020 high school graduates who enrolled in college in the fall decreased by 22% with high poverty, low income, and urban students bearing the brunt of the decline. With that landscape, our enrollment actually increased by 4%. And our college graduation rate has also steadily increased every year over the last five years, with college possible students three times more likely to graduate than their peers from low-income backgrounds. A recent survey of college possible alumni five and 10 years out from their college graduation shows five-year grads with a median individual in income of forty to fifty nine thousand dollars and over a third of tenure grads with family incomes of a hundred thousand dollars or more. Ninety eight percent are employed, ninety four percent have health insurance and eighty three percent are saving for their retirement. And importantly, over a third reported a debt load of less than ten thousand dollars and on average all respondents left college with less debt than their non college possible peers. Now the state of Minnesota has been a critical partner in our growth. With the support of the state of Minnesota, we've grown from working in 24 high schools, as Senator Clausen mentioned, to 66. 
and we've grown our presence from the Twin Cities metro area to across the state and greater Minnesota, from Worthington to Eveleth Gilbert. Your support in building that program, which is a, we call our Navigate program, it's a tech-based and virtually administered version of our program that allows us to serve students in greater Minnesota, but it also set us up very well to weather the pandemic by having all of our curriculum already modified to deliver remotely and the infrastructure built and refined over the last six years, we were able to seamlessly move our entire program to a remote model with very little disruption and achieve the outstanding results that we did this year. So I'll leave my testimony there, but want to end by saying thank you to for the incredible support that you've provided and all that you've made possible for students in Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Clausen, for introducing the bill, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for hearing our, our bill today. And I'd love to turn it over to my colleague and uh, College Possible Program alumna, Jesse Ortiz, uh, when you're ready, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, and thank you um, uh, for your, your testimony. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Ortiz. Hello, I would like to thank the chair committee for giving me the opportunity to share my experience with College Possible. Before I talk about it, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Jessica Ortiz and I'm probably a first generation college graduate from St. Catherine University with a degree in education and Spanish. How I got the degree is where College Possible comes into play. My parents and I were both born in Ecuador. Uh, neither of my parents are college educated which meant that they had little to no knowledge about the college process. My parents knew from the moment we moved to the United States that I would be going to college, but they also knew that we would need all the help that we could get due to our lack of knowledge. Luckily, my sophomore year of high school, I heard about a college access program that was recruiting students to provide support and guidance throughout the, the college process. I didn't think much of it. I applied immediately and soon after I got interviewed and was one of the very fortunate 40 students selected to join this program. To this day, I am very grateful for this opportunity. Throughout my journey of junior year of high school, a very wonderful human being became my mentor, friend, and teacher. My coach guided me throughout the ACT test process and gave me all the tools necessary for me to take the test. She then helped me write my college essay and would always say this essay was special because I would be telling my journey to college represent to representatives. The college application process has so many components that as a first generation student, I would have not been able to keep track of. I didn't even know the difference between net price and sticker price or what FAFSA meant or why I needed to apply to at least five institutions to have a better college option. When I was selected for verification, my coach was there every step of the way and even wrote a script for me as I called institutions. When I received my financial aid packages uh, senior year, the first thing my family and I saw were numbers, big numbers. There was a lot of confusion, but my coach was able to sit my father and I down and explain line by line what each number meant. She was very patient as both my father and I asked many questions. By May 1st, I submitted my deposit and committed to St. Kate's. The journey was long, but my coach never gave up on me. She shared, my college ex she shared her college experience with me, gave me advice, and above all, she always assured me that I, a first-generation, low-income student, had the potential to do many great things. I appreciate her greatly to this very day. With the continued support that College Possible gave me in college, I was able to navigate any obstacles that came my way to obtain my bachelor's degree. I believe in College Possible's mission because I was a student and I was able to achieve success by utilizing my talents and reaching my full potential. And of course, with the help of my CP coaches or College Possible coaches. I wanted to give back to my community and the program that made my college degree possible. For this reason, I served uh, as a coach the 2016 through 2018 in hopes to guide students just like my coach had done with me several years ago. Now as a program coordinator, even though I'm not working directly with students, I am happy to be providing the trainings necessary for our coaches so that they can too support our students and keep them at the center of our work. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and for allowing me to share my experience. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Um, are there any questions or comments from committee members? Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have a couple of questions uh, for Mr. Wilson. Um, Looking at some of the information we have here, 
and um, some of the numbers from the past. I see that in 2019, your, the number of students you served dropped, and then again in 2020, and, and I'm sure some of that is due to uh, COVID-19, uh, but we did increase your appropriation uh, in, the, in 2020 and for 21, and can you help us understand then, do you have uh, funds left in reserves, or if not, can you uh, explain and help us uh, know what you've done with those uh, funds, and then can we expect potentially an increase in number of students served here uh, going forward? Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Rick, for your uh, good question. Yeah, we, um, part, part of it is definitely, you know, in recent times due to the environment in which we're operating and the challenges we're facing, but going back um, a few years ago, one of the things that we have, it's really been important to us is that we're, we are working with the students who are the right fit for our program. We talk about uh, working really with what, what we call the mighty middle. And so we know that there are students who are high achieving and uh, are likely to go to college. And we know that we have a program that works really well with students who are very unlikely to go to college. And so one of the things that we really uh, wanted to focus on was making sure that we were having the time and resources to really focus in on the students who were right in that middle, who were very unlikely to go to college uh, without some intensive support. And what that meant was a little bit of a refocusing uh, the students that we were working with to make sure that we were really targeting that, um, that group of students. Um, so when you see some fluctuation in numbers, that was one of the drivers as well. We, one of the other things that we have really been focusing on, we were in uh, kind of breakneck growth for a long time. You know, we started in 2000 and we're served about 35 students. And now with the uh, high school and college students, we're right around 6,000. One of the things we wanted to do in the last couple of years too, was really take a minute and um, focus on our outcomes. And um, as I mentioned, one of the um, effects of that is we've seen our graduation rate increase uh, about a percent every year. And so over the last four years, we've seen about a 4% increase. Um, and to, for us, that's been very important because we wanna make sure that when we think about growth, we also think about growth on, on the other side of students graduating successfully. And we feel like we've got that in a, in a good place. And so to the kind of last part of your question, yes, one of the things that we'll be doing intensively um, as we sort of come, hopefully come out of the coronavirus pandemic and think about next year is to get back to the growth of students and make sure that we're continuing to, to work with as many students as possible, especially the, the students in that, as we call it, kind of the, the academic middle. And to the question about reserves, yet we, um, we try to maintain or we work to maintain um, the industry sort of best practice of three to six months of operating reserves in case something were to happen. And so um, we do have, um, as an organization, about uh, just about three months of reserves. So we're kind of at the, the bottom end um, of best practice. So we're, we feel okay about that, but we, we know there, there's opportunity to grow there to, to be within that three to six, six, uh, three to six months best practice of operating reserves for a nonprofit. Senator uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so with, with the increased funding that you had received, it, it didn't look like uh, there were any new uh, coaches that were hired. Can you help us understand how that extra, um, how you spent that extra money then, if it's not uh, been building up your reserves? Yeah, so um, uh, we, one of the challenges that we had for a bit a few years ago when the um, labor market was strong and was what it was, um, it was hard to find coaches at that point in time. So that was one of the challenges that we faced because unemployment rates were so low and it was really competitive uh, in the hiring field. So that was one of the challenges that we faced. And so we were, we were able to actually add coaches this past year from where we were the previous year. So when we were budgeting last year, one of the things we made sure to do was think about the number of coaches who were serving college students. And that's where we grew the number of college coaches from, I think we were at 27 there, we went to 31. Um, so there's been some fluctuation there. All of the money that, the, uh, that we received from the, the state goes into direct student support. So that's one of the things that we're uh, very serious about. And my, my colleague Kumar, who is here, who, who could um, 
uh, he, he works very closely on that report. He could add a little bit if I miss anything here. But we um, twice a year submit um, an invoice and that tracks how we've spent the money, uh, the state money. And that always goes 100% into direct student support for the coaches and staff needed to support students as the large portion of our budget is the staff required to operate the program. Senator Eric. Thank you, and I just one more question. You know, as you've been expanding out into uh, more areas of the state, um, it appears that you've been doing most of that virtually. Is there any plan to potentially get in-person uh, coaches out into more of the rural areas? Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick, for your uh, good question. Um, Yes, that is accurate. When we launched this program, uh, the intent was to have a virtual program that was delivered remotely. Uh, we have a name for that, and we're calling it our Navigate program. And uh, our model, our base model, what we call our flagship model, which is what we were doing until the, the launching of this new model, is an intensive in-person program where uh, coaches are in schools on the high school side four days a week. Um, and then they're back in our office on Fridays for intensive training. One of the things that's important to our program is the sort of uh, in-time intensive training that our coaches receive and the best practice sharing that they can do together as a group. And so when we uh, thought about our expansion into greater Minnesota, we know that that training and that time together with fellow coaches is, is critical and important to the success of the program. And so as part of the challenge was how can we grow our program into greater Minnesota while still maintaining that intensive training and, and community building and best practice sharing that's important. Um, so the, uh, the path there was the virtual program. At this point in time, we, we don't have plans to grow our in-person coaching outside of the seven county metro region. We have in-person coaches in some of the suburbs where um, for example, in Coon Rapids and in Burnsville and other suburbs, but that's about as far out as our in-person uh, coaching uh, goes right now. And again, as, as of this moment, I uh, don't have plans to grow that in-person model outside of that region uh, at this point. So thank you for those uh, comments. Uh, I should point out that there is uh, six members of the higher ed committee that are from outside of the rural, outside of the metro area. So it might be a good idea to figure out how to get out there. Um, but anyway, um, I can't resist trying to say Kumar's last name, Valesubramanian. Is that correct, Kumar? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You nailed it on your first try, incredibly okay. impressive. Uh, <laughs> my name is Kumar Valesubramanian, and I do have a couple things to add to some of the comments that um, Jeff Wilson um, added on there, you know, in particular when it comes to in-person coaching for students in Greater Minnesota, while we don't plan to permanently put students or put our coaches in person in those places, we have added budget to allow multiple trips for in-person visits. So while they're not able to be there full time, we are driving our coaches around the state so that they can build an in-person relationship with their students a couple times throughout the year so that then when they are working in a virtual space, they're a little bit closer and connected to each other. And then the final thing I would just add is, you know, our increase in funding from the state of Minnesota, well, we've had a decrease of students. That decrease almost entirely has come from our urban population. And a lot of the funding from the state of Minnesota is towards our growth throughout greater Minnesota. So you'll see consistent growth um, of the number of students outside of the seven county metro area who are supported by College Possible. And it's that increased funding from the state that's allowed us to jump into that so strongly. So thank you so much. Uh, and, and well done on the last name. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when you got a name like Thomas Sony, it gets mispronounced all the time. So I try and I try and uh, see what I can do when someone has a hard name in front of the committee. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the committee members? Uh, Senator Claussen, any final comments? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the testifiers uh, sharing uh, the college possible story. Uh, I've been familiar with the program here for a few years. I, I do know that they change lives, they provide opportunities, and I think uh, especially for low-income students that that's uh, really 
um, something that's needed in our state, and uh, I hope that uh, College Possible that uh, is recognized as we start building a budget. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Klassen. All right, seeing no further comments from the committee, uh, thank you all very much for your, your uh, contributions today. We will lay Senate File 829 over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And uh, I'll pass the gavel over to Senator Rarick for the last bill. I, we're, we're running short of time, so I'll keep my, my comments really brief, and um, um, then we can turn them over to the testifiers. So Senate File 1975 is, uh, is uh, amends the state bank grant program, which is uh, based on shared responsibility model in which the student and the student's family and the government contribute to the cost of attendance. And under current law, the student is expected to pay 50% of the cost of attendance, and this bill reduces the student's re responsibility from 50% to 47%. And um, bas basically speaking, the, the bill will increase grants for the lowest income full-time students by 500 to $777, and the average grants will increase by 18% at community colleges, 14% at state universities, and 10% at the University of Minnesota and private colleges. And so these, these would uh, be a real uh, big uh, opportunity for students who are struggling to pay for college to get a little bit more money and to help them afford college. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it over to the, with, to the testifiers. All right, thank you, Senator Tomasoni. And so we will go to our first testifier, uh, Brenda DeRosas Lazaro. We got your name right. Uh, please state your name oh, for the record perfect. and begin your testimony. Uh, my name is Brenda De Rosas Lazaro for the record. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, as I stated for the record, my name is Brenda De Rosas Lazaro. I was raised in Albert Lee, Minnesota and graduated from Albert Lee High School at the top of my class in 2018. I am now a junior at Gustavus Adolphus College, majoring in political science with a minor in public health. After graduating next year, I intend to work for a nonprofit organization that focuses on immigration, public service, and public policy to help build experience for graduate study in political science or public health. I hope to help those in my communities, immigrants, students of color, and first-generation college students and lead them to the correct resources that not only improve themselves, but their communities as well. I am here today to speak on behalf of not only my fellow guestees, but to provide perspective of some of the most underrepresented groups. I hope to have provided you with a new perspective and for you to gain a greater understanding of the importance of the Minnesota State Grant and the effects on its recipients. The continuation an expansion of the Minnesota State Grant and financing for higher education institutions are the start of an effort to close the opportunity gap that underprivileged students face. I ask for your support in Senate File 1975 to increase the capacity of Minnesota State Grants and to help more students like myself attain a post-secondary education. My college journey was full of unknowns. I didn't know where to even begin my college search um, let alone if I was going to be able to afford it. The grant program allowed me the opportunity to access higher education at a great institution like Gustavus. It autonomized my educational journey and the journey of nearly 80,000 students throughout Minnesota. At Gustavus, I have developed long-lasting relationships, not only with my peers, but with professors, faculty, and community members. This is an experience I know I wouldn't have gotten at any other institution, um, especially not with disproportionate student to faculty ratios. Um, I have gained more opportunities for both personal and professional growth, and I can't imagine that having that elsewhere. I was able to choose the college that was best for me at an affordable expense with the help of the Minnesota State Grant. And it's especially important now during the COVID-19 pandemic that we provide the resources for students to attend these institutions and to continue to cultivate well-rounded citizens. COVID-19 filled my educational journey with more unknowns, and I can't imagine that it did for everyone else. 
and I didn't know if tuition was going to rise drastically or if I was going to be able to afford to continue my education at Gus Davis. So the Minnesota State Grant had made that possible for me and continues to make it possible. Attending a four-year private college seemed impossible, but Gus Davis and the Minnesota State Grant made it possible, and now I stand here with new goals and aspirations. I do not stand before you for my personal gain. I stand before you for the 12 and 16-year-olds that live with my parents with dreams of making history like our new Madam Vice President did. My parents brought me here in pursuit of the American dream and their daughter speaking to the Minnesota Senate Committee for Higher Education, Finance, and Policy is farther than they had hoped for. And I would like to thank you for that opportunity to speak on behalf of first-generation students like myself and to represent hardworking immigrants like my parents. And finally, I would like to thank you for your efforts and concerns in higher education, finance, and policy. I look forward to an equitable and autonomized process to higher education. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much for that testimony. Next up, we'll have Michael Sullivan. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairs and members of this committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Michael Sullivan, and I'm a senior at the University of St. Thomas studying business administration with a concentration in marketing. I am from Hibbing, Minnesota. My mom is a part-time teacher, and my dad is a small business owner. My dad's business has been rocky due to the economic fluctuations with COVID-19, with most of his customer base being bars and restaurants. I have two younger sisters in Hibbing, aged 19 and 16. My, Sof my sister Sophia has both cognitive and physical challenges and my mom spends much of her time supporting her. I am very grateful that my parents highly value education and that they encourage me to find a college that best fits me. They were to have supported me no matter what type of higher education I chose, two-year, four-year, vocational, public, or private. I personally knew I wanted to stay in Minnesota for college. And because I'm interested in business, I selected St. Thomas. St. Thomas has helped me build connections to the business community and this spring, I'm graduating and I'm proud to announce I have multiple job offers due to the support of St. Thomas and their alumni network amid a global pandemic. I am very grateful for the state grant program as being a recipient. The program gave me an incentive to stay in Minnesota for college and enabled me to find a college that fits me best. I currently hold the role as the president of the undergraduate student government, and I've been involved with helping students from greater Minnesota feel welcomed and supported on campus and have authored a new role on our student government specifically for our greater Minnesota students. I do everything I can to pay for college to keep, and to keep my debt level manageable. I have worked multiple jobs throughout college and averagely work 38 to 45 hours a week to support myself. I pride myself on being able to graduate with no private loans. Like many college students, I am very concerned about being able to manage my debt. Your investment in the Minnesota State Grant Program will help students like me keep their debt manageable. Thank you for doing what you can to improve the State Grant Program and to make more students and families eligible. I promise you that I do not take this for granted. At St. Thomas, we continually challenge to advance the common good through thinking critically, acting wisely, and working skillfully. I vow to you today that I will pay this forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and please support SF 1975. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, um, yeah, Senator Mike, Thomas Mike, Michael Sullivan is an example of excellence in education on the Iron Range, and I want to thank you for testifying here today. Thank you very much, Senator Thomas Oney. Yes, thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we have Paul Pribino. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, we could just leave it with uh, Michael and Brenda because certainly they speak to the power of this program uh, much more persuasively, I think, than, uh, than I can. I'm Paul Pribino. I'm the uh, president of Augsburg University in Minneapolis, um, where I am uh, just uh, finishing my 15th year. And though there are days I wish I had retired a year ago, um, I come to work every day um, excited about the education that we're offering uh, to students like Michael and Brenda that is made possible by the state grant program. So I'm here to uh, testify in support of Senate File 1975. And I want to thank Senators Tomasoni, uh, Clausen, proud Augsburg grad, 
uh, and Senator Dagan for their um, support uh, in moving this forward. So I, I, when I think about this in my perspective over 15 years and the kind of impact I've seen the state grant program have on our students during that time, I think about two um, central pieces of uh, really compelling reasons for this. One, of course, is about access. Uh, and we know that the state grant program um, provides access to the students both um, so they have the choice of where to go. You've heard that from both Michael and Brenda. They had to think about their options. And as residents of this state, they were able to take the state grant program to the institution that was best for them. And whether that's Augsburg or Gustavus or St. Thomas or the U or one of the community colleges, the power is that they get to make that choice. And we really value that piece of, uh, of the state grant program's uh, design. But it's also the case that this is a, a program that is very much focused on equity, um, another piece of the access argument. And that is, it's a grant that is targeted at those students who have the greatest need. Um, and I think that that, um, in particular for Augsburg, that has been a central uh, part of our um, ability to see the state grant grow program really helping to grow uh, the students that we're able to serve. Just a few quick data points uh, to point that out. Um, at Augsburg, where our last three entering classes were 65% students of color. Um, so we have become a majority BIPOC institution over the past decade. We're proud of that fact, but that wouldn't have been possible without the state grant program because 49% of our students receive a state grant and 48.5% of our students come from families whose incomes is less than $50,000 a year. So this is a grant that is targeted very directly at those students who have the greatest need, who want to come to Augsburg or Gustavus or St. Thomas or the U or Minneapolis College, and it's made possible because of this state grant program. But the other thing I want to just mention as the other compelling reason for this, it's also about outcomes. Um, so you hear from both Brenda and Michael this sense of giving back, this sense of what this is going to mean for them when they graduate from Gustavus or St. Thomas. And I think about uh, somebody who has actually testified in this committee in the past, uh, one of our recent graduates, Brandon Williams, I think Senator Clausen probably remembers Brandon, came to Augsburg um, as a Minnesota resident, uh, came as part of our Act 6 program, which is a program focused on urban leaders. Um, became the student government president, led almost every other organization he was a part of, is now working at the Minneapolis Foundation for R.T. Ryback, uh, helping to distribute funds, in fact, to meet the needs of folks in the neighborhoods where he came from, and intends to go to law school um, and then be able to do public service law going forward. So I, I think about just the myriad of students like that for whom the state grant program both made it possible for them to get into college, stay in college, but ultimately to graduate and to go out and uh, to make a huge difference in whatever they choose to do, whether it's in business um, or nonprofits or government service. So um, I'm very happy to uh, to come forward uh, anytime you want me to, to, um, to be able to offer my um, deep support for the state grant program, in particular for this, uh, the change in the formulas, which would allow even more students to be able to receive the support. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Members, do we have any questions for uh, Senator Tomasoni or any of the testifiers? I am not seeing any. Senator Tomasoni, any Mr. closing Mr. comments? Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, to the um, people who testified and, and thank you to the committee for hearing the bill. Um, you know, the pandemic has uh, hit a real lot of people financially, especially lower income families. And uh, many of the students have lost their on-campus or even off-campus jobs as a result of it. And parents have uh, been more than likely have lost jobs or income also as a result of the pandemic. So um, it's a really, really good time to increase aid. And this, this is a good bill to do that. And if we can find the money, we'll certainly do our best to try and come up with some increased aid to the state grant program. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. All right, with that, Senate File 1975 will be laid over for possible inclusion, and I will hand the gavel back over to Chair Tomasoni. And with that, uh, members, we are going hybrid from now on. I like this, so meeting adjourned. <laughs>